with over 20 years' experience teaching grades 7 through 12 mathematics. His professional activities include consultations and conference presentations in North America, Asia, England, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Qatar, and Africa. He is an author for the NCTM Mathematical Lens, which is a column, mm -hmm. yeah. and member of the advisory board for the National Museum of Mathematics in New York City, the New York Lens, uh, who is also being people Okay. Um, he's a recipient of the 2015 Margaret Sinclair Memorial Award recognizing innovation and excellence in mathematics education awarded by the highly prestigious Lewis Institute. So we are very, very fortunate and very grateful wow. that you combated traffic and a very difficult drive from San Antonio last night, cut short your time in NCTM to join us here today. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to uh, be down here, and I'm glad that I made this connection with Koshi uh, here, probably a bit through Glenn, because I, I don't know Glenn very well, but uh, you know through the Museum of Mathematics that I've you know I've met him. So um, anyway, we'll go out for a walk in a little bit because I thought it might be nice for us just to get some fresh air, get some exercise, and see the math you know out there. But um, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about my background with these math trails. Um, for me, personally, this actually happened a long time ago. So in the late 1980s, I was doing some television programs for TV Ontario. Uh, this is a public broadcaster in Ontario that produces a lot of educational programming. Um, but I was out in the streets of Toronto and elsewhere doing these TV shows with the camera in front of me, thinking my students should be here with me, you know, and doing the mathematics with me. And it just kind of sat there for a while. Um, and then uh, a little bit later on, I was teaching a course at the University of Toronto. And um, there was one of the teachers who said that they had an annual trip at the end of the course. This was a summer course I was doing for pre-service, where we went out to one of the islands in Toronto and did some mathematics. So we actually didn't do a lot of math. It was more just a nice way of ending the school year. But there was a bit of mathematics out there. But I... You know, that idea was kind of stuck in the back of my head as well. So those two things were there. And then I ended up uh, in the 1990s teaching in an all-girls school uh, in Toronto. A lot of my career has been in uh, public coeducational schools, but I was in an all-girls school. And I, uh, I decided to, to really think seriously about going to the school. What would I teach? What would I change in my teaching practice? So now that I'm in a single-sex school, would I change anything? Maybe not. So I did a lot of reading about gender issues, met with a lot of people. And, um, you know, the idea of, of uh, girls working collaboratively kept coming through. The idea of mentoring, having older women mentoring younger women. There were a lot of ideas like this. And I ended up deciding to do some math walks uh, with the students. It all, it all kind of came from these experiences of being in front of the television camera, uh, this walk back in 1985 uh, on the Toronto Island. So it was all kind of bubbling under from that and then took the students out. And um, it was really a wonderful experience with these students uh, to do some mathematics uh, outside of the classroom. And I'll get into some reasons uh, for that. But this was a magical moment. This is actually a very defining moment because it's hard for you to see in this picture this is just so old fashioned. But um, when I did my first math trail, my vice principal had asked me, what will you do if some students are away? You know, what, what's the game plan here? So uh, she decided it would be good to take a lot of photographs. So I photographed everything along the trail so that, um, you know, the students could look at photographs afterwards. So we were back in the classroom to work on the trail questions for several weeks. Um, they were looking at the photographs, and these students here have a slide projector. That's how old this is. So there's a slide projector here, and they're looking at slides. But what gradually started to happen is students were developing their own questions from the experience. So it ended up not just being my questions. It ended up being their questions as well. And it was really a magical moment where they were involved in the development of the questions to do that. So I thought... For me, that was really a moment when I really learned a lot. And the students actually got up and were leading lessons 
And they were saying, you know, when we were at the spot where there was, there was this, this cube on the corner of King Street and Bay, like, you know, and then they were improvising and coming up with things. And that was really nice to see the student engagement that way, where it was them, you know, doing things. So um, anyway, the, the math trails, I think partly what I've been able to do is teach in a nonlinear fashion. And that's really helped me as a teacher. So when I look at the curriculum that I have to teach, um, I've taken it and I've kind of packaged it at times where the content is together, where it's integrated. And it gives students a more holistic way of, of, of learning mathematics when it's done that way. And so with this trail, when I mentioned to you that we worked on it for several weeks, we were actually working through the curriculum, but the tr it was all just embedded within the trail questions. So that's how I ended up organizing this. Um, you know, I don't know whether you'd agree with me on this, but I think that this is probably one of the biggest issues in the teaching of mathematics, is the linearity. Less so at the elementary level. I think there the mathematics is integrated with the world and it's part of it. But as you start to move away from the younger years and into the middle school years and into the high school years, it really becomes very linear. There's this path that people are on. And in fact, math teachers believe that this is, this is the path. This is the one and only path of learning. So you must do this before that and that and that. And it's just all got to be done that way because it's just the way it is. And there's, you know, been attempts at changing this. There was a great program in England called Task Maths um, that uh, was out for a number of years. And instead of the usual chapters, the, um, the, the, the textbook was all organized in tasks. So students had tasks to do and they learned the mathematics from these tasks, these rich learning tasks. In fact, rich learning tasks are kind of the buzzword right now. But this program was out of England like ages ago. You know, everything kind of comes around. You know, a lot of these ideas are, you know, old. In fact, these math trails, I spent a lot of time in Singapore developing math trails. And, you know, I had teachers come up to me and said, you know, like there were teachers doing this in 1972. You know, this isn't a new idea. So it, a lot of things are kind of, you know, they kind of come and go and, you know, and all of that. But um, I think one of the key features of taking students outside is one, getting some exercise. Um, you know, it's very physical. Getting students to see the mathematics outside because it's not what often happens in the classroom, you know, where they do that. Yeah. Uh, could you give me an example of how you can do uh, a nonlinear app? Yeah, so abs yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I do some workshops for teachers on this, uh, you know, but um, I'll see if I can give you a quick example here. So uh, just, well, it'll be a math trail example. So I've had students in a shoe store. So they've been in a shoe store looking at all the boxes. And as you know today, these shoes come from all over the world. So they're looking at the boxes and they can see the shoe sizes in different countries. So my shoe size is a nine and a half in, in American, but the shoe size in Japanese would be something else. You know, it might be 45, but then there's also a Cambodian size and the European size and on and on and on. So I've had students collect the data and look at all the different shoe sizes and then make some graphs. So they could graph the shoe size in Japan versus the shoe size in the US. And as we might expect, as the shoe size in North America goes up, the shoe size goes up in Japan as well. You know, you would want some sort of system like that. So, you know, what's the relationship between those? Can you make an equation for this? So, you know, so that you could convert from one system to the other, uh, you know, looking at that. So, so that's an example of something where there's a lot of different pieces of mathematics in that. You know, there's the collecting of data, looking at it, making the graphs, uh, looking at a model of it, you know, so that you can extrapolate and predict it. But it could also be about the boxes the shoes are in. So looking at the boxes and looking at the volume, of the boxes that are being used, the surface area, the cost of those boxes. So now we're into that unit of mathematics. 
So there's so many pieces of mathematics that could be taught through that one activity, you know? And so we're really addressing a lot of the expectations of the curriculum through the one thing, you know, rather than kind of doing it in chunks as you go along. Does that make sense? Is that what you were thinking of? Yes. Yeah, so it's certainly true that there are some things that you, you have to know before something else. Uh, you know, I would, cert I would not argue against that. That, you know, it's going to be hard to do calculus, uh, you know, with a, a tangent if you've never done, you know, an equation of a line. So definitely. But there's a lot of pieces of the curriculum that we could do. In fact, with my grade seven and eights over the years, I actually did a lot of calculus with them. We did a lot of these great optimization, max min problems with them, but we did it at their level, you know, without all of the calculus. So you can still do a lot of those concepts, uh, related rates, things like that, at that level, you know, without all the formulas and the calculus and things like that. So that's what I meant about the, the nonlinearity. Um, the, the typical classroom scenario is where you're following the textbook and you'd be doing this chapter and then that chapter and that chapter. And oftentimes the mathematics isn't blended together very well. In fact, I actually had an experience in school. I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck, but I had a teacher in high school yell at us, you know, at the end of the year, so why don't you remember anything that we've done this year? Like, you've, all, you've forgotten everything that we've done. And she was angry, you know, over this. And I put up my hand and I said, well, you know, maybe we would remember it if we'd used it during the year. You know, there was no integration of the topics. It was all in parcels, the way we learned it. And so, of course, we forgot it all. Like, the stuff from September, we never looked at it again. So how would you remember it? So, you know, that's, it's that idea of actually blending together the content. It's tricky for teachers. I, I guess in my career what I've done is I've used a textbook as a guide. You know, that's kind of guided me through the year. So at least there's some structure to the course and parents have some idea of what we're doing. But at least I've tried to blend together a lot of the material so that students can, you know, see, see how everything fits together and get the big picture of it. As when students graduate from high school, and leave high school, a lot of them leave with very little memories of what they've learned. All these little compartments that they've learned, none of it fits together and it's gone. You know, they've learned it for the test and for the standardized test, but it's just gone. And in a way, it's not surprising. You know, it's not in their heart. You know, they, they've had a kind of a lousy experience with it and it doesn't stick with them. And a lot of them end up running as fast as they can from mathematics, you know, because it just was such a lousy experience. I think that's where a math walk can change some of this. I found with teachers that you don't have to totally change what you're doing in the classroom. Because any time a program comes along that asks teachers to totally change what they're doing, the success rate is probably going to be zero percent, you know, of trying to overhaul everything. So I've helped teachers do a math walk where they could do it in one hour or two hours once a year, you know, or a couple times a year, maybe not on the scale that I did where I had the students in Toronto for the whole day, as that, that becomes harder to do, you know, for teachers to do. But um, the, the idea of actually taking students out, um, you know, even if it was just once a year, what I've also tried to do with teachers that it's just too complicated to go out is I've had them bring it into the classroom. And Koshi and I have talked about that idea of bringing it in. So you can take photographs. You can go outside as a teacher or as students and bring those photos in and do a gallery walk in your classroom. And so students can get up and actually move around from photograph to photograph. And a teacher can model that by having some math questions uh, initially. Here are some math questions related to some of these photographs. And by the time you get to the seventh photograph or the fourth photograph, it's up to the students to come up with their own questions, you know, to think mathematically 
about what they're looking at and to design the question. You know, and, and it turns it over to them. Of course, you were going to mention something. Mm -hmm. so you're talking to a small number but a very, very background. So it'd be great if I know you have a bunch of examples you're going to show us um, to kind of, if you have an example that would kind of connect with those levels. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So, um, so I guess briefly, I mean, we'll see this outside, but you can do these things anywhere. Um, and I think the biggest piece is just pretending that you're putting on a piece of, you know, a pair of mathematical glasses and looking at the world that way. I, I love these pictures. They were taken in New Orleans and then it's like these big glasses. And, and when I see these, I'm actually thinking of putting on a pair of mathematical glasses that I wear around. Actually, I have mine on all the time. And um, so when you go out, this is a list of things that you might want to be mindful of. And it depends on what you're teaching. So the grade level you're teaching, but looking for numbers, looking for patterns in the ground, looking for shapes and solids, um, curves, again, depending on what you're teaching, reflection, shadows, ratios, rates. These are all things you could be mindful of looking for. Yeah. Is it possible that you get a copy of your PowerPoint? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm going to send this to, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and I'll put in a couple of the things into the, the folder as well. So definitely. Um, so as you're searching for these things and seeing these things, you can start to think about what the questions would be. You know, what would you ask your students to do? And I think the, the key points here are really slowing down. We walk by things that we don't even notice. We're generally not observant. We tend not to be curious. Where we wonder, you know, we stop and look at things and wonder about things. And to think mathematically, these are such key points. If you don't slow down and you're not observant, you're just going to walk by things. And the idea of thinking mathematically is probably not going to happen because you didn't see anything, you know, along the way. So I think those, those are really the essential points uh, that you need. And um, it would be really good if you just go out with a colleague. It's great professional development. You know, go for a walk with somebody. And, uh, and, you know, just start to think about what you teach, um, what's your curriculum, whether it's elementary, high school, uh, university level, and get a, get a group of like-minded people to walk together and to do that. And it's just great conversation because that's one of the sad things in education that I think is still true. It's very isolated. I think we, we tend to go into our own classrooms and we're very isolated. There's still elements of that. Do any of you feel that way in the classroom? It's been like that for really as long as I can remember, you know, of being isolated that way. I, I mean, I think back in my career of some of the conversations I've had with teachers where we've been at a photocopier and, you know, we're, we're both teaching the same course and what are you doing today? And the teacher says, well, I'm doing section 3.2. And I said, well, I'm doing section 3.3. And that's it. Like, that was the conversation. Like, there's nothing about how we're teaching it. You know, how, well, how are you students doing? What, what are the things you're having trouble with? You know, just those rich conversations. It's, it's getting a bit better. You know, we're trying to move into lesson study and a lot of these things. But, wow, change is slow in education. But this could be a wonderful opportunity for you to just get some conversation going with your colleagues by actually going for a walk. You know, it's that exercise of, of doing this that could be very powerful. And it could begin the conversation for other stuff as well, you know, that could come from it. This is what will happen when you go out, is all of a sudden when you slow down and you're observant, you'll just start to see it everywhere. It'll be like that book, The Math Curse. Everywhere you look, you'll just see shapes 
You'll see numbers. You'll see patterns. You'll look at words. You'll notice things. And you'll, you'll, you'll take note of these things. And it'll just, it'll be right in front of you. And it'll be, wow. It'll just pop right out at you. And it'll never be the same. Some of you may already do this. But, uh, but maybe after today, this will really uh, come on strong for you. And you can find this anywhere. Um, this could be in a very small town. It could be on a farm. It could be in an urban city. It could be here in Dallas. It could just be anywhere where the mathematics will jump out at you. And you'll see the beauty of things. Um, this is what students tend not to see. Like when you ask students to think about mathematics, this is probably the opposite of what they would see. So perhaps the way it'll begin for all of you is by bringing it into your classroom first. This might be a safe way of doing it, a fairly simple way of doing it, where you're not actually taking students outside, but you bring the photographs in and you have some mathematical questions here. You know, it might be in this photograph here that you show students and, you know, there's a 105 and a 107 and 109 and you might extend the pattern. So there might be a row of three numbers, you know, 111, 113, 115, another row, you know, because it might be like a big apartment complex or something and somebody decided to arrange the addresses in this very artistic fashion. I mean, they obviously were trying to do that here. I mean, they could have just put the numbers in a row. So why not continue it? And uh, how many numbers would there be all together? You know, if you had four rows, what's the sum of the numbers? Why did they start with 105? Like, where's the one? You know, where's the 101? Like, what, what was this building? You know, why are these numbers here? So uh, it could be a very simple thing like that. Or this one right here, uh, this is some cups from uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. So it's some artwork that people have created with cups, you know, around this. And, you know, if, if you had 20 cups, could you make this? How many cups did they use? How did they put this together? How did they make it? You know, um, if you drew a circle around it, what's the area of the circle? There's, you know, a number of questions that, you know, you could ask here about this. This is an apartment building in uh, Penang, Malaysia. And um, these are beautiful uh, semicircle patios, or balconies rather. And there's questions about the amount of space that people would have, you know, on their balcony. So how much space would they have in that semicircle uh, on the balcony? Um, but there's lots of questions here that you could ask. Quebec, I love their stop signs. Because when you have the three-way stop signs, the four-way stop signs, they actually have the stop sign from your perspective. So you can see that that stop sign is for people coming this way, and that stop sign is there. So you have rotations, you have reflections here uh, in the stop sign. And um, well, I was in Lockhart, Lock, Lockhart, is it Lockhart? So I stopped in Lockhart along the way, and uh, this isn't from Lockhart, but I... I found a shop whose address had a half. So I was out front taking pictures of the address. And I just, I love finding examples like that where there's a fractional address. And the owner of the shop came out and was curious why I'm taking the picture. And I said, well, look, I mean, there's this beautiful a half. And I said, I'm wondering where a third is at? Where's a quarter? Like, why aren't they here? And uh, I was teasing him. I said, why didn't you choose two quarters? Like, that would have been cool. You know, people would have stopped, you know, looked at it. And I actually asked him, if I mail you something, I wonder if I send it to 622.5, if it'll get to you. So he said, well, do it. So anyway, I'm going to arrange to mail him some stuff. But it was this musical, beautiful music shop that was there. But, you know, that's slowing down. You know, that's an example of it. There's probably lots of people who have walked by his shop and never noticed that. And that led to a conversation with him that led to a conversation about guitars and the frets in the guitar. And I was in that shop for a while. Maybe that's why I was late, you know, coming here because I, I just spent so much time there. But, um, you know, the next time you fill up your gas, 
uh, in a car, the numbers at your gas pump. You know, what are those? Like 87, 89, 93. You know, it's the octane, but what are they measuring? What are they representing? And why do we see those numbers here? Why isn't there a 98? Why isn't there a 85? You know, what is this? There's actually a formula on the gas pumps as well. For those of you that teach middle school, there's a formula. It's R plus M divided by 2. There's an algebraic formula right on your pumps. Did any of you notice that? You have never seen that? You've seen it. So there's an example of why we need to slow down. Right? Think of how many of us have reached for that nozzle, put it in, and it's staring right at us. And it's inviting us to ask, why R plus M over 2? Like, what, what are they doing? You know, are they trying to torment us, you know, with, with this algebraic formula? It turns out that there are several ways of measuring octane. There's a research method and a motor method. And, um, and there's no agreement. So they average the two. So it's R plus M over 2. So that's what's going on there. But uh, so when you're doing a math walk, or if you're out taking photographs, the key thing is slowing down, looking at artwork, looking at patterns, looking for numbers, looking for shapes, and thinking mathematically, you know, about what it is you could ask students. And then the magic will happen. You'll be able to model that with, with students and with adults. You know, that whole idea of thinking mathematically. And at some point, you can turn it over to them and have them, especially with adults, because, you know, adults have a lot of different experiences from their workplace elsewhere, and they can add to, you know, to the conversation uh, with questions as well. Um, this one, I had a long conversation with the shop owner in Boston. As the name of the shop is X squared. And I said to them, you know, like that awning should have been square, right? It, you know, square awning, the profile, like why would you have a semicircle when it says X squared? It's like, where's the square? That shopkeeper just was looking at me wondering, like, why are you talking to me about this? Uh, his experience in mathematics was, was not good. Um, for the high school teachers, this photograph down here, it's a pub in Bristol, England, and it's zero, to the, zero degrees is the name of the pub, but it actually is zero to the power zero. And in mathematics, that's an interesting question as to whether it's defined or not. So does this place really exist? You know, does it exist? Does it not exist? Maybe I just made up the picture, you know, but uh, anyway. So, but that's what you'll start to see uh, when you look at things. That's a close up of the gas pumps uh, for you there. So, um, just go on to the next picture here. So if we were doing a math trail and we were going by in this building in Montreal, what might your question be? So what might you think of if we went past this? So what, what is it we might ask students? Or what might they ask the students as well? Any questions at all? That come. Oh, very nice, right? Ah, lines of sim. My goodness, we have a lot of stuff already, don't we? Right, number of triangles, lines of symmetry, the color progression. You know, if if there is one, it may well be that you know we could search at this for a while and not find one. And if there's not one, then make one. Right? What would you do? You know, what, what color progression would you use? Uh, you know, if you were designing this. Anything else? Types of triangles. Types of triangles. Wow, that's gorgeous. You can take out the rectangle yeah. for the window. You measure the area. Oh. Or, I don't know. Measure like the yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. So now you're about area. Wow. So if, depending on the grade level, if we had students here, we could be doing a lot of the mathematics content from the curriculum just here. That's what I meant earlier. You know, that we could be doing some questions dealing with area, 
the width symmetry, um, types of triangles, patterning. All of these are pieces of the curriculum from different places, but we've all got them all blended together uh, within this one stop along the path. Yeah. Wow, that's a beautiful question. So there's a couple things you could do. Right, you could have yourself in the picture. Right, you get somebody else to take a picture. Because I know I'm five foot eight. So I could be in the picture and then now we've got some proportions, right, that we could use. So that's one thing uh, that we could use. I often carry a meter stick with me. So I walk around with a meter stick. I get kind of looks, you know, like especially in, a, in an urban area, kind of walking around with a stick. And, you know, hopefully no one's thinking that I'm doing something bad with the stick, you know. But uh, you could have a meter stick in the picture as well. That's a bit tricky because the meter stick has to be in the same plane, right? If I was standing in front of this building way in front, then there's some distortion in that. So. I need to be right up against the building there. Reality also is that there's some distortion when you're, when you're holding your camera, you know, and being able to, because if you're looking up, you know, there's some keystoning. But, you know, if it ends up the numbers are a little bit out, like, who cares? You know, like, I'm starting to think of using drones because a drone would be really interesting that you could actually have the drone go up and get a picture straight on of something, right? And you wouldn't have the, the keystoning? That's a possibility. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, that is a gorgeous question. That is so sweet. So what time was this photograph taken? Right? And and what would it look like half an hour later? Right? That's beautiful. So if we came back half an hour later, would it look the same? Uh, and are they really shadows? You know, did someone maybe in a very clever fashion actually paint, you know, the shadows on here? So that, you know, would have that illusion. And it always looks like this. I mean, you could do that. Um, they are actually shadows. But that's a great question with the time Overall, absolutely. Um, for the high school teachers, there's actually a nice question that one could ask here. You know this window right here? You see, there's a choice. You could have different rectangles for that window. That point right there could have been here, and you'd have a different rectangle. So how would you do this so that you get the maximum area for the window so that your viewing space is the biggest. If you teach elementary or really young, that question may mean a lot to you. You know, don't worry about it. But for the high school crowd, there actually is a beautiful, um, you know, mathematical question. It's actually a calculus question. But you could do this with graphs without any calculus at all. So uh, that would be quite, quite a nice question uh, as well about the area that you're seeing through. You could also say that, you know, this class up here admits 50% of the light compared to these two windows, maybe for some reason. So the amount of, you know, sun that's coming through, there could be questions like that as well. Did you take I did, yes. Yeah. I was lucky. Yeah, I'd like to tell you that I was lucky. Uh, or I did, did it deliberately, but it was actually just by chance. I love to walk. And I, and I think this, this whole thing has really helped me become a real walker, where I walk everywhere. And so this I just stumbled across. I was walking up the street called Saint Laurent Boulevard and going for this very long walk. And I, I remember this moment because I was in an area where I really 
hadn't found a lot of kind of stuff. And I turned around and it was like, wow. You know, it was just this building. It was like, wow. So I stopped and took some photographs. And I'm back in Montreal quite a bit. I can't find this building. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I've tried to look at the, the pictures I took before, the pictures I took after, you know. And this is a long time ago. So I've, I've forgotten exactly kind of where I was positioned. So I would like to go back and actually time it so that I maybe have other moments, you know, and find them. But, um, you know, one other piece that didn't come up is the cost. One could also ask about how much it would cost, you know, to make this. What material would you use that would last? Um, the cost of the material, the cost of painting. Like, are these things made out of metal? Is it wood? Like, what is it? you know, that they've used uh, and that associated cost for it. I mean, that ultimately would be partly about area, uh, you know, as well. Um, there's all these, I don't think you can see here at the bottom, but there's all these colors as well uh, in that building. And I, I think this was a reflection coming down from here, but I'm not sure. Actually, I just noticed something in that picture. Huh, I don't think I'd ever actually looked at that. The parking, you know, on the side there, PR Prig, PR, PRIG. Maybe that's a clue to where I actually took this picture. So there's something on the side there that uh, I need to go back. Actually, I do a lot of questions like that with students where I take a picture and ask them not when it was taken, but where it was taken. So can you figure it out, you know, from something in the picture of where it was actually taken? So when and where. Um, any questions on that one? Anything else about that? That could go a lot of grade levels, couldn't it? You know, this one. And that's something I try to do when I'm designing questions is, because I've had experience teaching middle school and high school. so. You know, I try to be thinking about the different grade levels. And I've worked with elementary teachers a lot as well and thinking about questions for that as well. So that one stop could be used uh, at different levels. Oh, what a beautiful question. Absolutely. So could you determine that? Because that also might help me figuring out where I took it. Right, it might help me get some sense for where I was standing, you know, at the time uh, when I took it. Koshi, if I figure out, I'll be in Montreal soon, if I figure out where this was taken and I get more pictures, I'll share them with you. And you can share them with the group. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, yeah. And, uh, you yeah, know, I'll make sure that this gets uh, uh, shared with you, this PowerPoint as well. Do you have any questions about this one? So this is a building in Madison, Georgia. Uh, is there anything jumping out at you here? It's all the shapes that are square, the yeah. Wow. There's a lot of shapes, isn't there? Question, it is. So really young students could be looking at the shapes they see. As you get a little bit older, you know, it could be the slope of the roof. Right, so that's middle school, high school. Um, I have another picture of this with me standing in the picture. But do you really need that? Koshi, you were asking earlier about, you know, the actual dimensions of things. There's a couple options. If you wanted to ask a question about the percentage of the building that's taken up by this window, you don't really need any actual dimensions for that because any scale would work. So you could just measure it in the picture, measure the whole and get the ratio. But if you really, really want the exact dimensions or close to exact, there's something in the picture you could use. What would it be? The fence. The fence? Oh, very nice. Maybe there's an average height to a fence, right? Yeah, so, oh, the door. 
So the fence is a bit tricky because it's off to the side and, you know, is a fence, a fence, a fence? You know, is there kind of a standard? But there's certainly some standards for doors. So, uh, you know, you can go to the Home Depot website, you can look up doors and get the height of the door and then you're good to go. So in this case, we could, you know, do that. I like giving students questions about this one and asking them for specific things. What is the surface area of the front of the building? And I often get students coming back to me saying, like, I don't, I don't know what to do here because I don't have any dimensions. And it, you know, puts them in a position where they have to do some problem solving. And I say, well, you know, what, what would you like to know in the picture? Is there anything I could tell you? And sometimes well, students will say, well, like, you know, if I had the height of the door, then I could answer your questions. And I like to then say, well, do you really need me, you know, to get the height of a door? Like, yeah, I'm trying to stay out of the problem solving and let students, you know, find their own way to doing it rather than, you know, there's, you all know there's been a trend in education these days of less telling and getting students to be more independent learners and able to, you know, come up with things on their own. That's easier said than done. I mean, it's, uh, it's tough getting students there, you know, to do that. But um, any other questions that you can think of here um, with this? Well, this was also about slowing down. So when I was driving through Madison, Georgia, you know, I was watching the traffic, of course, but, you know, my eyes were also open to just, just seeing, you know, the area. Um, and I just happened to drive by this and I just, I had to stop, you know, like I, it just was within me. And I think for all of us that, as teachers that we should want to know more, you know, and to look at these things. This is in downtown Montreal and it's actually a giant cube. So, but the cube is split apart. Do you have any questions? Is there anything that is jumping? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So at the high school level, you know, there's some sort of curve that's been used. They didn't just take the cube and just slice it, you know, in two. Actually, at a younger level, you could take a cube and just slice it in two and examine it. You know, it's not what they did here, but, you know, you could be inspired to do that from the picture. Say, this is too complicated for grade three, so let's just take a cube and look at it and slice it and look at the pieces, you know, and see what we see. I'll tell you, some days when you go by this cube, it's actually closed. There's some wheels underneath here, and it's mechanical. So it closes and it opens. And again, the idea of being observant, slowing down, looking at things. I've gone by this some days where it's been closed, other days where it's been open. And I've thought, why? So why, why is it so? I've gone into the building. It's, it's the big court downtown Montreal. I think it's the Palais de Justice. And I've asked security guards in there, like, why was it closed yesterday? It's open today. And the usual response I've got is, what cube are you talking about? <laughs> and like, and, you know, I've taken them outside, like, like this. Well, when did they put that there? You know, like, we're often like that, where we're not aware. Um, I mean, when I travel and I ask somebody for directions, this happened to me all the time in San Antonio. I was asking them where the Emily Morgan Hotel was because I was staying there and I was kind of meandering around and it was people are getting out their phones and they're looking stuff up and they had no idea. And I was like a block away, you know, from the hotel. <laughs> like it, we're just not observant, you know, about our scenarios. The reason this is open and closed is because uh, if the big court case of the day is guilty, the cube is closed. You will never think about a cube the same when you, when you see this. And if it's not guilty, the cube is open. It's freedom, confinement. What a powerful way of using a geometrical object to convey a message. The problem is, is a lot of people just walk past it, you know, and they haven't got the message. So we need to stop more, you know, and see things. 
But that's really amazing. So I'm always looking around and I think that as math teachers and educators, whatever we, whatever we do, if we can get students to, to start to look around, uh, they'll see things. This is me in a bit of a silly mood. I, I'm a punster, I love puns and I love being silly. And, but uh, this was in Durham, North Carolina. And you know, I was out for a walk and I saw a sign that said two speed bumps and the speed limit was 20 miles an hour. And I went one street over and there were three speed bumps and the speed limit was 15. Hmm. So if you have four speed bumps, so what would the speed be? 10 miles an hour. Skip counting. You know, it's just basic mathematics here. So if you had 10 speed bumps, the speed limit would actually be negative, which would mean you would turn around and go the other way. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a really nice question about the shape of these things. You know, what do they use so they tend not to do too much damage to a car? Uh, you know, if a car's going over it at 60 miles an hour, it doesn't matter what the shape is. But, isn't that interesting? Wow. So they're, not a lot of uniformity. I, interesting, that's an interesting question as to why. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, and that uniformity might actually be a good thing because you know what you're going to get, you know, when you're going over. I know, is that something? Yes. Yeah, the language. Yeah. And I've also noticed that around the world the different language that's used as well. Yep. So it, um, anyway, that's the kind of the middle school math question where students would do a T table and, you know, they'd fill these in. It could be just skip counting at an elementary level. And, uh, you know, if you had seven speed bumps, what is, this? you know, what's the speed? And at that point, as I say, it's negative, you know, overall. So, um, these are just a few additional pictures for you. Um, and I'm just wondering if anything jumps out at you. These were taken in San Antonio. What do you see here? So you see, what, what are you looking at here? Yeah, beautiful shapes, aren't they? It's actually a condominium project. Uh, actually, you know something, was this San Antonio or was this Waco? I stopped in s several places on the way. Um, San Antonio. It's agave. Yeah, so that's the A, the G, the A, the V, and the E. Oh, I think we could really we could spend a lot of time. Yeah. What would the rest of the alphabet look like? Right? Give students some manipulatives at a younger level, you know, and actually make them. So we can't all go to San, San Antonio right now to go see this. So this would be a really good example of bringing it into our classroom. So as educators, we can take pictures and find things and bring them in. But I think the first one would be just, you know, what do you see? And of course, they're going to, students are going to tell you about the squares and the triangles and the circles and quarter circles. Uh, that's great. But what else do you see? The, the fractions, absolutely. Yep. Um, but, uh, but if you may need to tell them that it's agave, A-G-A-V-E, right? Because who's, who's going to notice that? Uh, Yes, absolutely. Make your name, you know. So if your name is Mahima, you know, like make your name Mahima with these objects. And if you can't do it, then dream. Come up with your own shapes, right? You know, you don't have to use these shapes, but use some shapes and do that. Yeah, I went past this and I just was so enamored with it and I stopped. And, um, and I noticed it was this condominium complex and they were you know, selling things, and it was really beautiful. 
This was um, in one of the museums in San Antonio, and it was this beautiful pentagonal fence with uh, triangles on the ground. So you can't see it very well, but there were five triangles. So there's one, two, three, four, and a fifth one in behind. And uh, what questions might you ask here? Can you cover the Ooh, wow. So the surface area of the five triangles, you know, in terms of the fencing around it. If it was super tall, you wouldn't be able to do it, right? Because there's too much here. But, you know, depending on the height of that thing, you could actually probably have enough material. Yeah. And it looks like, I don't know what's on, on the green triangle, but it kind of says there's stones or something. Yes. It makes me think that maybe it's a type of game, or there's some type of, I don't know, like it's interactive to be able to work with it somehow. Mm -hmm. Yes, there actually was. Okay. So there was some interactivity to this. This was actually the floor of this museum where it was an exhibit by just women artists. And um, I, I took images of who the artist was and the thing like that. And I can make sure Koshi gets that so that you can look up the artist, you know, and see what they did. Um, when I'm out for a walk, I'm just looking everywhere. I'm looking up, I'm looking down. I think that's all part of it. And this was on the ground, you know, it was in front of a store. What do you see here for your math questions? Any ideas? Right, your shapes? They're all the same shape. All the hexagons, right? Yeah. In fact, they're all regular hexagons. Right, you know, where all the sides are the same and the angles are the same. And then there's a, a par parabologram, square. Ooh. So you're at it, and circles as well. Yeah. Uh, the... Wow, that's beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, you're kind of forming a you know, it's not like a perfect circle, but you could draw a circle around it and you could draw a parallelogram around this. In fact, a series of parallelograms, right? So there's a whole bunch of parallelograms. In fact, there's actually a series of circles too. You just need to look beyond the color because that circle right there is extended and extended. And so the number of hexagons per, um, you know, circle that are being used. And it's skip counting. You're just adding more and more hexagons. Yeah. Do you know why you do that? Because the pattern from what we see doesn't match up. So I'd be interested in what the next one would be. Like the little flower pattern in the middle. It's dark, dark, and then the next one that can't see color. That's beautiful. I do. So I can, I can either look it up in a moment or I can send Koshi a larger version so you have the whole context. That was deliberately done so that um, your question, it, it would invite that question. How, how does it continue? You know, what does it look like? Um, you know, in the end. Uh, like what's out here? You know, in the continuation of the pattern. This is the entrance to a store. So it was on the ground and you walk into the store. So it was right on the floor. Uh, Yes. So the shape of a square, and since this is using a, a hexagon, correct? Since it's using a regular hexagon, but it's creating other shapes, it makes me think about using different shapes to derive formulas. Oh, that's that's, that's beautiful. That would be kind of cool to try. Absolutely. Like yep. Kind of a non-standard unit that yeah. you're using, you know, rather than the square as the basis of building larger things. So definitely. Uh, Wow. Wow, that's great. There's a lot to think about, isn't there? Just with these images. I think it, you know, having an eye of being able to see certain things is really critical here. But I think we can all have that. It's just a matter of stopping to see it. You know, it's the walking by of it. And we'll miss it. Like just walking past the store and not taking note. Um, we're going to miss that opportunity. 
you know, to have the mathematics that's there. You know, I think of students doing all of the standardized tests. The U.S. tends to have much more of this than Canada does. We have it a little bit, but there's nothing really high stakes. But I think of students in the U.S. writing these tests, and I think a lot of these students don't have mathematics in their heart. You know, they don't, they don't care about the subject. And so, you know, we're pushing them to do these tests, and you've got to get these things done. And I mean, I understand the tests. I mean, you want to have some standard you know, doing it, but it's not in their heart. And I think really part of the secret to improving test scores is just helping students to see the beauty of the subject, you know, to see that they're surrounded by it and to change their attitude towards the subject. You know, if you have a better feeling about the subject and, you know, some feeling that it, it, it is around us and that it's artistic and developing some confidence from things like this, and being empowered to think of questions on your own. I think all of these qualities in the end will help. Um, you know, the, the hard part, as you know, in teaching is it's, it's tricky because teachers feel under the gun to, you know, make sure their students do well in these tests. And um, so I think being able to do this, to just completely change the teaching practice and start to do this, it's not going to happen. I think the best we can hope for is just integrating these kind of things into the classroom. You know, the teachers would have been doing something to teach the topic. So do some of this sometimes, you know, to teach that topic and bring it in that way. I think we have a better chance of things happening that way um, without kind of totally dismantling what we do. Um, and maybe occasionally going outside you know, to do something out there and getting some exercise. Yeah? Do you know anything about that Oh, this one here with the four hands. What a great question. So why in the world would they have four hands? That's a great question. That seems so bizarre. I mean, you're, you're clearly looking at this time here being getting closer to four o'clock, but what is that time? Like, what are they doing? Like it's... Are they, is it two times for like two different cities? Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> like, wow, that's a gorgeous question. It turns out, I looked at this clock fairly closely, and I'm convinced in this case that that's just a continuation of that. Oh. So it's just a line. Okay. But isn't that wonderful how it created that illusion that there were two different, you know, times being shown here. So you have uh, opposite angles here. So those angles will always be equal. Um, I have, it's yeah. Continuation, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yes, yeah, so maybe it would. Maybe that was part of their thinking, yeah. But it is unusual, isn't it, that they actually had the hands stick out, you know, like that. Uh, I have seen some clocks where there were, as you suggested, two clocks. And I thought that was pretty clever, you know, to have that kind of setup to it. Uh, amazing. Um, the sum of the numbers, you know, in the clock, right? We could ask questions about that uh, for younger students. What's the angle between the hands right now? Kind of looks like it's about 90 degrees, doesn't it? It's interesting too because it has the, it's, like it's kind of sectioning four sections, but it's not how I would, like, would typically section four sections per clock. Because I would se section it by quarters and halves, like 15, 30. So it's really yeah. Good. Absolutely. That caught my eye as well, how they grouped the two, three, four together. So I might have grouped, as you say, maybe the one, two, three, you know, or maybe, the, you know, something else, yeah. or the quarters, you know, to put them in quarters, but it, that did catch my eye. I was beside this clock for a while because I, I wanted the 90 degrees. 
so that so I have a series of pictures that I took and one of them was when it was 90 degrees. With this picture, I could ask when's the last time that the angle was 90 degrees and when's the next time, you know, that it'll happen. So, um, but I thought the clock was very beautiful. Um, you know, just the design of it. But I, I love these questions about the hands and the sectioning of them. You know, the sum of the numbers in each section, two plus three plus four, five plus six plus seven, eight plus nine plus 10 and so on. What pattern do you see in the sum? You know, this adds up to nine and this adds up to 18. Hmm, double. Hmm, interesting. So two plus three plus four is nine. Five plus six plus seven is 18, double. Gee, I wonder if this will be three times. Oh, come on. Three times that. 11 plus 12 plus one didn't work. But maybe if that was a 13, right? There's just lots in the sectioning as well. Um, so I'll make sure that you get this PowerPoint so that you, you have that. The, the last thing I just wanted to tell you here is, um, you know, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. So um, are all of you aware of the NCTM? So some are, some aren't. So, um, you know, I think I have online access here. So um, I'll just um, pull this up here. Um, my home page right now is maybe you've seen this website before. It's actually an um, amazing website. Uh, I have to meet that person sometime. Oh, I'm kidding. This is the NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And if you're doing some work with math educators, this would be a good organization to get to know. Um, it is membership based. They do have some free things available. Uh, they run a lot of conferences. The reason I was in San Diego was because they had their big annual conference. Um, I say big annual conference, it's, it's getting a little bit frightening these days. The way people get their professional development is changing. I think in the year 2000, they had, I could be wrong in this, 20,000 math teachers at the conference. This year, there was about 6,000. So it's really dropped. So people are getting their PD in different places or they're not getting PD. You know, could be several things. But um, it's a good organization, a lot of material. They put out some high quality journals. But uh, I've been writing a column for them for a long time. And it's actually called The Mathematical Lens. And what I'll do is I'll give Koshi a few back issues of this column so that uh, you can see them. This is going to be more middle school, high school, because the particular journal that I write for is called The Mathematics Teacher, and their target audience is kind of grade 8 to grade 12. They have a middle school journal, and they have another journal for elementary of about K to 4. Um, but uh, every one of the columns that I write, that I co-edit, I get people sending me material so it's become a community. They all begin with some photographs. So this is from the High Museum uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So I took these photographs. There's uh, this beautiful artwork when you walk in by Molly Hatch. So she has all these dinner plates that go from the ground all the way up to the top of the floor. And the title of the column is kind of catchy. How high is the high? So can you look at this picture and tell me how tall the high museum is? So, you know, they had to do some reading. There's information given about the size of the dinner plates. So they had to do a bit more reading and how many dinner plates are there? The dinner plates are touching each other. So, you know, if you know how many there are, you can get the height of that floor. And then people had to go online. How many floors are there in this part of the building? And then go from there and do it. 
And uh, the nice thing is that students have to make some assumptions and go with it. You're, you're probably going to assume that all the floors are the same height, and, um, which may or may not be true. But uh, you come up with an estimate, uh, and then what we encourage students to do is to do some digging and see if they can find information online about how tall it really is. Because oftentimes that architectural information is posted there. But that's what the column looks like, and there are uh, mathematical questions that all deal with those dinner plates. And this column went from middle school to high school. So there was a wide range of things, and then there were you know, some, math some answers as well. So we tend to supply the answers because teachers are busy and they would prefer to have that. But um, if you have people within the system you work with, if they join the NCTM, uh, you can look at all of these columns archived and, and everything else in the journal as well. There's great uh, articles in every issue. But um, I think I'm now up to about 115 of these, of these columns. So there's one each month. So there's been a lot of them. In fact, the 100th one, I have a co-editor from New York City, and we celebrated the 100th one by doing a 100-block walk. So we walked 100 blocks in Manhattan. And uh, we took photographs and then developed a column around that. So we celebrated it by doing that walk. And it was 100 glorious, walk, 100 glorious blocks, you know, from First Street and First Avenue. We walked all the way up First Avenue and went up to 101st Street. Um, we actually stopped at 100th Street, and all of a sudden my co-editor said, that was 99 blocks. And I said, no, that was 100 blocks. She said, no, we didn't start at zero. We started at 100, or one. So, you know, we had to walk that extra block, you know, and do it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, this has really motivated me to do a lot of walking. And I think that that's something just generally in our society that we need more of. You know, people walking. As a tourist, when I'm places, I, I like to make sure that I get out and walk and see things on foot. You, you see much more, you know, doing that. And speaking of walking, we should go out in a minute and actually see a few things outside uh, for a couple of minutes. Are there any other questions that you just want to address here before we're out? Uh, are yeah? there any examples of your math trails that you could look up now that you had the benefit of your thinking about them, like, so we could kind of see how it looks for a student? Yeah, absolutely. So, you could Google me, and you'll find some in New York City that I've created uh, for Math for America. So some of those are posted online. I have some math trails in MoMA, uh, the Museum of Natural History, Ellis Island, uh, NYU and uh, Columbia University campuses, Madison Square Park, Bronx Zoo. So, there's, so you could find some of those. What I'll also do is I'll put in a trail uh, into the, I'll set up a little Dropbox folder for you and I'll give you a copy of a trail so you can see what it looks like. And don't get too hung up in the math if it isn't the level you teach. Um, you know, what you can do is look at the, the, the content, um, you know, that, uh, not the content, but the structure, um, you know, of, of the trail and how it's organized. The one maybe I'll put up for you is one that I did for um, some girls in Toronto. I've done this several times. This is the Canadian Association for Girls in Science. And um, this was a math trail that they did in downtown Toronto. And you'll be able to see, you know, there's question one, it tells you where to start. Uh, question two, it tells you where to go. Question three, question four. And, you know, it says, you know, go to this building, turn left, go here, stop in this area. And uh, here are more questions. And then uh, it evolves. And in some of the trails, there's points where the students stop and it's a blank page and they have to come up with their own questions, uh, you know, as well. This particular one was fairly short, so there wasn't, uh, I don't think there was any component here where students actually uh, had to um, develop their own questions. So we wrote for about, uh, I think this one was around an hour, hour and a half. It was an after school program for this association, but I'll put this trail into the Dropbox folder so that you have an example of it. Um, 
A lot of people have done these trails uh, in different ways. I don't know Glenn's work uh, really well. I'm actually excited to learn more about it, you know, through Koshi and her website. But everybody has kind of different takes on what it means and how they do it. Um, I guess it was back in 1993, I gave a keynote address at the Phillips Exeter Academy Conference uh, in New Hampshire. So it was about these math trails that I was doing. It was 1996. And in that audience, there were a whole bunch of teachers that came up to me afterwards. And they just loved the idea. They'd never thought of this. And they said, we can do this. And they did. And I've just been amazed at where they've taken it. You know, they've dreamt about things that I never even thought about. You know, these teachers went back to Philadelphia and Boston and New York and San Francisco and all over the place and made it their own. And it, and it all came out kind of differently. But it, it can mean a lot of different things. But I think fundamentally, uh, it's, it's about making these connections between the math curriculum and the world out there to give some students some sense for why they're learning this and to have it in their heart and where they can actually feel it and, and feel the beauty of it and the practicality of it. Because without that, I think we're in trouble. It's just more of the same for the next 20 years, you know? Like, probably all of you too, I go out and I talk with people about what I do and I just get the same reaction of, I hated math, I didn't do well in math, you know, it was a bad experience, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's just most people feel that way out there. And I think either we kind of start to address this or we just give it up. You know, like, why do we keep torturing people? You know, with some, maybe there's some other subject we could teach where they could learn the same skills, you know, and, and not have this endless torture of like, oh my God, you know, get me out of here. Because a lot of people feel that way in math, you know, from their experiences, sadly. Um, actually, I like it when I meet people like that because it's, for me, it's an opportunity to try and change their viewpoint, you know, about it. <laughs> get them engaged in doing math, whether they want to or not. <laughs>